You can turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through chapter 2, verse 3. So, we'll take the second half there of chapter 1. Well, I've got a, a question for you. What's in your closet? What's in your closet? Ooh, I look, everybody looked up all at once. <laughs> don't worry, I'm talking about clothes, right? I don't really want to know anything else, not in this setting. But I'm asking about what's in your closet in terms of clothing. Uh, when I look in my closet, I see a couple of different sorts of outfits that I might wear for different occasions. And in fact, I have a couple of different closets in my house that, that store different kinds of clothes. Maybe you've got something in the garage for the dirty stuff, maybe your suits or somewhere else. I have uh, all my suits in one particular closet, and I have suits for funerals and for weddings. In another part of my closet, I have basketball shorts and t-shirts for exercise and just for lounging around the house for, for wrangling little kids, things that can have spit up on them. That's my closet over there, right? I have tennis shoes down there for walking. I have uh, wingtips for whining and dining. I have cleats for Saturdays at the paintball field. I have ties, I have t-shirts, I have button-ups, I have jeans, I have khakis, I have joggers in several different colors. I have a pair of reinforced nylon pants that I wear to protect me from paintballs. They're the most ridiculous looking thing that you've ever seen, but they have a purpose. They can prevent rocks from cutting into you and all sorts of harsh surfaces that I would encounter when I'm out there playing with my buddies. And if I, I dove on the dry ground in my slacks, not only would they provide no protection, but I doubt that they would stay on at all, right? If I showed up to a funeral dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, I would be shaming not only myself, but the deceased and their family. In every case, what I put on and what I put off has to do with the end that I have in mind. That's the purpose of different sets of clothing. The concept is easy enough to consider when we're talking about the various scene changes and different activities that, that make up our lives. But how often do we consider whether our whole way of life is itself fitting? And to what end exactly? This morning, we're going to hear the Apostle Peter address his audience about how their lives should look in light of the great salvation toward which their community was to be oriented and to testify about. What does he say these Christians are to put on? What's fitting? Holiness, without which the author of Hebrews will eventually note that none shall see the Lord. As we step into the text this morning, we're going to see that, that we're called to put off a certain thing, put off, in this case, sinful patterns that Peter will elucidate and make clear. We put off sinful patterns just as surely as we are called to put on habits of holiness. And afterwards, we'll step back and consider what these verses have had to say about how we might reverence our Redeemer in all of life, because that's really what Peter is saying. He's saying, live in a way that is fitting to who your Redeemer is and what it is that He has done. Let's read in First Peter, starting in verse 13. It says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile." knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls 
by your obedience to the truth for a sincere and brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. Scripture says, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Well, in the first 13 verses that we looked at last week, Peter opened his letter by expositing, that is, casting light upon, and extolling, that is, holding up the virtue of, the wonderful works of God in Christ in and through the economy of salvation. Remember that past, present, future sense in which we have our hope? He's reminded his hearers of the nature of Christian hope. That's what he's opened up his letter with. But now Peter is moving on to suggest that that such living with living hope is going to look a certain way. And he does not want his hearers to mistakenly assume that they can believe in God and yet behave as if they don't know Him. He's taking them into the depth of what's here in our Christian hope. The therefore that we start with, it signals uh, to read that everything he's about to say is predicated on what he's already said. He thought his thought is flowing forward. And so, so having exposited and extolled God's gracious salvation in Christ, think of it this way, he's now exploring the implications of what he has just said. Right, this, this doesn't stand alone as a, a sort of simple moral lecture that Peter is giving, but it is the logical outworking of the grace that he has already preached. Peter would have us live in keeping with the grace that has been bestowed which means that we are invited to dress accordingly, one might say. Um, you might think of it if you get invited to some wonderful party or to some lavish ball, the real honor, the real work has already been done, right? Whatever the relationship it is that you have with the person who invited you has borne fruit such that you've been invited. Um, you're going to be an honored guest. There's going to be a table that's set for you. There's going to be music to dance to, food to eat, people to meet. Everything is going to be done for you. What can you do to show respect for that? Only one thing, really. Dress accordingly and show up. In the same way, like that's essentially what Peter is saying. He's saying God has set the table. God has done the work. God will receive you. All you have to do, first of all, is come, like be there, and come in the right way. Dress accordingly with your life. Peter says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like a bride preparing to walk the aisle and join her groom, we are preparing ourselves in every way to make sure that we are fit for the moment that is coming. And this means that whatever glorious things we are called to put on, we must likewise put off that which is not fitting to this great end. We're called to put off, to lay aside sinful patterns. Peter uses the familial language of the household to describe what's being called for. This is not an abstract attempt at personal change, right? That's so important. Hear this all throughout this sermon. You could hear the wrong thing if you hear this the wrong way. Again, Peter's not giving a, a, a moral disputation or a lecture that anybody can obey. He is couching everything he says within certain metaphors that communicate the grace that undergirds this. And the idea of the family structure and the way in which he addresses this as a family matter indicates this, and you'll see it even in how he addresses these as obedient children. Peter uses familial language of the household to describe what's being called for. 
He's calling us to live as children who are obedient to the loving constraints of a good and righteous Father. That's the language that He chooses to communicate the truth. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. He's not giving this moral lecture. The sermon I'm giving right now isn't a lecture on morals that can be broadly applied to anyone who simply wants to clean up their act. No, Peter is addressing obedient children who have been reborn into the family of God by the Spirit of God through their faith in the gracious work of the Son of God. That's the audience. As a parent, in my better moments, the obedience that I'm trying to foster in our little son is the kind of obedience that both enables him and that eventually will ennoble him. It will both enable him and ennoble him with time. Here's an example. Oh, I've learned, I've been reminded that learning to go to bed on time is in fact hard. It is a difficult quandary if you're being exposed to it for the first time as a human and suddenly someone says, now is the time that you are going to bed. It just comes out of the blue. There you are doing your thing and some person with authority comes into your life and says, you are now going to bed. That's a hard moment. It makes you want to scream if someone forces you to go to bed before you have decided that you want to. But if you learn to do it, if you obey, eventually you are the kind of adult who can self-regulate your energy levels. You are the kind of adult, eventually, who can display the discipline necessary for a flourishing brain and body during your waking hours. It's interesting, now as an adult, the idea that someone would deprive you of sleep is the greater threat, right? The idea that someone wouldn't let you go to bed when you want to go to bed is the great catastrophe in our lives, right? I have to go to bed at such and such a time because if I don't, I know enough about what the lack of sleep will mean for my life the next day. You've been not only enabled to do this, but eventually you have been ennobled. It's enabling in the long run for a child to learn to actually obey. Learning to hold your tongue and not scream while others are talking is also not fun if you are too, and if you have a lot that you would like to say. But if you learn to do it, if you obey, eventually you are the kind of adult who is emotionally capable of rational discourse. You are eventually emotionally capable of empathy and of listening, and even of the genuine delights of civil conversation. And it all comes from that first part of their life where someone tells you that it's time to be quiet and let others speak. It is both enabling and ennobling to learn to obey. Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This is the putting off of sinful patterns, but it has two separate and equally necessary components to it. First, this is a call to resist the tempting passions. And Peter just assumes that they're a given that you know what they are to some degree. What are these tempting passions of which Peter writes? Down in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, just for the sake of illustration, Peter seems to list an assortment of them. He says, malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all slander. And he basically says, you know the deal, all that stuff all those kinds of things. Surely he could have listed any number of sinful attitudes and actions. He could have just kept writing because they would all fit. But Peter is speaking generally about the patterns and practices that come from a whole life that is still oriented toward the self. It's still centered in the self, the perceived advancement and preservation of the self. And again, I keep coming back to this, this illustration of small children. You, you can really see this. When you spend time with a little kid, you pick a toddler, they are adorably self-centered, right? They have no sense of your needs. In fact, it's always a revelation and a surprise when you catch them 
understanding somebody outside themselves or making a decision that is for the benefit of another, it's, it strikes us as incredible when we see someone so young do that. It's always a wonderful thing. But, but they're really a good example of that immaturity, that sense of uh, orientation toward the self and centering everything around the perceived advancement and preservation of that I, that me. The self apart from Christ is always oriented toward the advancement of its own interests. It's oriented toward the preservation of its own pleasures and privileges and self-directed powers. The tempting passions that entice the self always appeal in this way, even to us as adults. Maybe, you, maybe you've heard these words in your mind. You reach for something that you shouldn't have. Don't worry, you deserve it. <laughs> just take it, right? Just, you can justify it. Just don't worry, you deserve it. Or, hmm, what should I do in this situation? Well, this course of action would really be better for me. I don't even, you know, all things considered, this course of action is the best one for me. It's going to put me in the best position. Or, hmm, wouldn't I just prefer let it go this way rather than that way? Now, each sounds innocent enough at first, but turning, the, turning inward is never without consequence for others. And that's a lot of what Peter is hoping we start to see. Turning inward is never without some consequence for others. As social beings living within God's creation, we are always in the presence of God and others. And we're being awakened to that. The Spirit of God is reawakening us to this fundamental reality, bringing to light the fullness of what this means. I think of um, St. Augustine when he, would, he did a lot of work on the doctrine of sin, um, and then also, you know, in response to that, what salvation and sanctification are. And one of the major ways he talks about it is that there's this incurvature upon the self that sin has produced, this sort of doubling back in the navel-gazing, and that what's happened is essentially you're being straightened out, you're being unbent to be able to be oriented externally to God and to others, that that is the great work of grace in and through our lives. But this Spirit of God reawakening, reawakening us to this fundamental reality and, and bringing to light the fullness of what this means is always here. Think of this line, well, well, this would be better for you is exactly the kind of reasoning that would dull my awareness of the needs of my neighbor. If I start with that sentence, it starts by dulling my awareness of the person next to me. And in fact, that dullness will eventually become hardness, will eventually become ambivalence toward my neighbor. And that hardness might eventually become hostility in a moment when there is competition for resources. Wouldn't you prefer well, that one sounds innocent enough, but, but really it gets my thinking process started away from what God would desire and what God would will, and instead centers the question of action upon my own preference. Such hostility, malice, deceit, envy, slander starts with a simple temptation toward a self-oriented passion. And then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin to death. James 1.5 is clear. I, I always am brought back to fishing. I mean, this isn't in my notes, but as I just read James 1.5, I basically was describing a lure chain. Like when you set up a, a, a drop drag system that has to float in a river and the fish are so and so far down, Everything that they can see in your rig that would prevent them from eating has to be a certain distance away so that they can't see it. And you're using a tapered leader that gets smaller and smaller and lower and lower so that the thing they actually see that they want to eat is very far away from the thing that is going to catch them, <laughs> but it is actually completely connected. And so James 1.5, right there, that sentence helps you to see the full rig, the full jig that Satan has working upon you, 
right? It starts with, with something pretty simple, desire. Desire. Everyone's got desires. We all have desires. Okay, but those can go a certain direction. When it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Oh, that's not good. I know I'm not supposed to sin, but it looks a little more dangerous than desire. Well, sin is going to give birth to death. Oh, no, I definitely don't want that, right? So, it's this cascade in the direction of, of that which I do not really desire. It's a trap, James 1.5 is saying. Peter is saying, don't be conformed to the passions, to the first bit of thing that you can see. Don't allow those things to shape you and to set the standard for your living. Don't give them free reign. Resist them and resist them early. Resist them often. We're called to resist the tempting passions because they belong, Peter says, to our former ignorance. Well, ignorance of what? Ignorance of what God's plan for His creation is all about. In fact, it isn't all about me. It's all about God, and it's all about others. It's about the love of God that the Father has made known in and through His Son by the enlivening power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian God Himself is outwardly oriented. I was studying this this week, and one theologian speaks of Him as, an, as a fountain of overflowing life, demonstrating His creative love flowing out from who He is. You and I are made by His love for His love, to image His love back to Him and to all of creation. This is what it means that we are image bearers of God. The grand and glorious vision that's been made known in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ is present on every page. And so, Peter is saying to reject the former ignorance that we were in, the ignorance about whether the world might be just about us and our passions. Live considering what we know about the goodness and the beauty of God's plan for the world in Jesus. Resisting the temptations, rejecting former ignorance, this is what Peter means when he says, do not conform. And again, critically, this is not moralism. It's the fruit of the gospel. This is not Peter saying, do more. This is about experiencing the power of what has already been done. The good news frees us, again, from the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. And in my notes, it just says, underlined right here, do you know Jesus? Do you know Him? You know, in a, in a church of this, um, of this age and established stature, and I know all of you, it's difficult sometimes to make the gospel as explicit and clear as it would need to be if you did not know Jesus and if you did not have any idea of what the offer really was. But when you come to a passage like this, it forces the issue because you could mishear the passage. You could think that church is about cleaning up your act, but in fact, it isn't. It's about offering the gospel. It's about understanding what is really on offer in Jesus, and, and I can't think of a better way to describe it than the one that we started with earlier, that you've been invited to something grand. You've been invited to something paid for. You've been invited to be an honored guest at God's table, despite who you are, despite what we don't have, right? Regal said, what do we, what do we bring to offer? Well, well, we have nothing. Well, sure enough, I looked in my pocket, and I still have nothing to bring to God, except you know, my life, that He would receive me. And that's beautiful because that's all the gospel needs from you, is that you would respond to the invitation that you would say, yes, uh, I'm willing to come. What do I wear? I would love to be an honored guest of you, God, that you would pay the tab for me. I don't have anything to bring, but I'm willing to come. And Jesus would say, come and be a part of my kingdom. Come and be my guest. That's the gospel. Turn from your, your wicked ways. Come and be my honored guest guests. As Christians, we are called to put off the way of life that was not life at all by resisting and by rejecting the passions and desires which tempt us towards sin, which, when conceived, give birth to death, James 1.5. The temptation comes to all, but, but we are enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live otherwise for God's glory. 
for our good. Putting off sinful patterns is one way of understanding what we're called to do, but it is not itself the whole point. The point is to put on habits of holiness. Put on habits of holiness. In fact, much of what Christian hope entails is the integration between the head, the heart, and the hands for the glory of God. First, uh, Peter aims at the head and the heart. That's where he starts to to teach. He wants to address the the rational faculties of those who claim the name of Jesus. And so, so what does he say? Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And then follow his reasoning here. He gets into a dialectic with you. Well, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, and you do, right? Well, then conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And so, here's what we want to catch. Here's what Peter's doing. He is making an argument. He's making an appeal. There is reason being deployed here. It makes sense that if we're calling upon God in all of His justice to judge in righteousness and and surely we are, that is what everyone who's prayed to God, the true God, has ever prayed for, then it follows that we ourselves would be seekers of righteousness, that we would want to live in the protection of His righteousness and justice, His mishpat, His sadaka. It only makes sense to live our lives in the goodness and freedom afforded to us, considering the incredible price that was paid, right? Peter flashes the price tag. He says, don't you remember how much it costs to get you in? Don't you remember how, what the price tag is of this wonderful thing that you've been invited into? Like, wouldn't you come if you understood the expense that's been poured out for you? For example, we find it, it quite natural to understand what is meant when leaders of our country tell us to value and tell us to use and to steward our political freedom because of how many soldiers have died to provide it for us, right? That's a very normal form of reasoning that we hear in public. That argument makes sense for us. It's a good argument. This is exactly the same sort of statement. It's the same argument. Jesus' blood is worth more than anything, and it was shed to bring us out from bondage to sin, death, and the devil. We should value that freedom such that we would actually dare to walk in it. That's what Peter's saying. And walking out that freedom, living in and through those fruits of the Spirit, will always transfer from what we believe on paper to how we behave in our actual lives. Not only does the gospel affect our hearts and our minds, but it also makes use and employment of our hands. The central verse toward which the whole of Peter's argument is building is right there in verses 22 and 23. Take a look at it with me. He says everything he said, and then he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, well, what do we do? We've done all that. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Why, Peter? Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and the abiding Word of God. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Peter is saying that since the true source and definition of real love has been made manifest in Jesus Christ, and because Christians are living in submission and obedience to Him and to His love, remember it's an enabling and an ennobling love, then the result is that an infinitely durable community is going to be formed in and around that love. Look to your left, look to your right. 
you are in this community. In fact, it is precisely the loving nature of this community that makes it a fitting nursery for hope. It's a nursery for hope. I came across a line from John Piper this week that comments on this. He says simply, love protects hope. It really does. Uh, in, in thinking of a, even the idea of a nursery as being helpful for this, just this week we had our nursery retrofitted and prepared for, for true infants, for tiny, tiny babies. And if you look at what goes into doing something like that, converting a small room, you, it takes a great amount of love. It takes people who think about what little tiny babies need, and they, they prepare the place to be suitable for that because what you're nurturing there is hope, right? Young children represent the future represent those who will be here after us, who will carry on the gospel to the rest of the world, who will honor God in ways we will never live to see. And it is your love now that protects your hope for the future. In the same way that church is that organ in the world, it is the community of love based in the truth which stewards the hope of God for the world. That's what we're called to be about. Each individual Christian has been born of that which is not perishable but is imperishable. And so the collective body of which we are all a part is equally imperishable and everlasting. What is at the center of this community that, that loves in accordance with the truth it is the Word of God, which establishes and refreshes it meeting by meeting. It's not static, but it is living and abiding the text says. This means that putting on the habits of holiness is something that addresses the fullness of who we are in not only our beliefs, but in our behaviors, in our head, our heart, and our hands. The Word of God addresses us, reminding us again and anew of the gospel that was preached to us. And Peter concludes by, by saying that we should desire this Word even as a young baby yearns for breast milk. It's the life source. It's the everything. It's the all in all to that child. Can we say the same about the Word of God to us? The last couple of weeks, our second one, Elise, um, has been working through some sort of a lactose allergy or something, but nothing's been more unnatural than to see a baby reject her bottle at such a young age, you know, because it hurts her stomach. As a parent, you, you start to freak out and start to think, well, what else can we feed this baby? Uh, and you start looking for supplements and different ways of going about it. And it seems like we're, we're finding something, but, but there's something so relieving and so wonderful to see when she finally does hook up to that bottle and she starts to eat. You say, oh, this is right. This is what a baby should do. This baby should be hungry for, for this. This is going to nourish her. And in the same way, I mean, when we hook up to the Word of God and we finally start to receive the nutrients that it gives and we say, I have to live in accordance with the way that feeds me, nothing could be more natural, nothing could be more wonderful, nothing could be more hopeful for us as those who live on the Word of God. Late night host uh, Trevor Noah was interviewed recently and he mentioned offhandedly how his mother is, a, in his words, a bit of a Bible scholar and always has been. And I, don't, I get the impression he might not really be a Christian, so he's trying to make sense of this from the outside. He's like, he's, he's describing his mother as if she's very weird. <laughs> so he, let me tell you what he says about her. He says, my mom is some kind of a, a Bible scholar or something. She actually reads the same book over and over again. She reads it all the time. And he's like, he says to the host, it's not that she doesn't know what it says. She knows what it says. She's been reading it her whole life, and she keeps reading it again and again. And he said, here's the funny thing. For some reason, it's always new to her. It's always new to her. Every time I talk to her, she's telling me some story from in this book that I know she's known forever, but it is new to her in some new way. It's as if it's always speaking to her. That's what he said. I thought, oh, you're so close. <laughs> it is always speaking to her. It is. You should consider what she says. But the good news fills us with the sustenance of God's grace. And I wrote in my notes, do you trust Jesus? Are you hungry to hear His Word? 
Lauren came to me recently, my wife, and she said, oh, something terrible has happened. I said, oh, what's happened? She says, in these last three months, I have just not had time to read my Bible in the way that I was before, you know, since our second has come. And she says, I notice it, and I really notice it. Now that it's been a few months and it's not part of my daily routine because I'm all around all hours of the day, it's, it's finally, it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I'm going to make a change. I'm going to get back into it the way that I was. And she found a new way into the Word for this year. But she's hungry to hear His Word. She got hungry enough that the alarm bells went off in her life and said, I have to eat. I have to go back. I have to make an adjustment, even in this difficult and strange season. As Christians, we're not mainly called to be sin avoiders, but Jesus pursuers. And I hope you see your Christian life that way. We are hungry for the Word of God, which is living and active in us, growing us in our capacity to receive more and more from God. He is enlarging our capacity to enjoy Him and to glorify Him. So we've seen Peter is, is calling us to put off sinful patterns and to put on habits of holiness, to live lives that are fitting to our end, to dress accordingly, as it were. And at bottom, we're being called to reverence our Redeemer, to live in a state of respect for what He has done and for who He is, a state of thankfulness and grace. So what areas might we pay attention to, right? If you have to get dressed for some party, I mean, there's many components to the outfit that you would put on. How might we reverence our Redeemer in the fittingness of our lives? I think it is painfully basic in just these three ways, just three to work with. The first is in the words that we say, the literal things that, that, that we articulate that come out of our mouths. <laughs> because Jesus says, guess what? They're really coming out of your heart. Oh, no, right? I would like to just stop the accountability at the edge of my teeth. And Jesus says, nope, it's going from down into the core of who you are is speaking and is coming out of you. Uh, just this morning, I was like changing the keys, fumbling, because I was coming to open up the church, and I like stabbed myself, and you know, I said, darn it. And little Ezra looked up and went, darn it. <laughs> but he can't say ours, so it just sounded worse. And then he said it five times, ten times, and Lauren said, what have you done? You know, and uh, I had to watch the words that were coming out of my mouth. I said, I'm sorry, you know, I, I poked myself, and he was there, and uh, there was this moment or even the words that I was saying became very, very clear to me that I'm accountable for them in some way. The words that we say, both privately and publicly. But sometimes it's not so cute, right? Think of the moments in your life where you've misspoken, or I've, <laughs> dare say, misspoken, and I said to myself, that was not cute. That, did, that was not a good look. That really did impugn my witness. I am a fool. Woe to me, Lord. I repent. Go before me. Bring grace into the situation. I want to live in reverence to who you are. And other times it is the works that we do, both privately and publicly. I am reminded of this man uh, who has donated this tractor to our church uh, most recently. He was just this guy driving down the side of the road, and he saw that there was some people doing some push mowing on our property. Um, and he owned a landscaping business at one point, and he had a spare John Deere tractor sitting in his garage. And he just pulled over and said, I sense that the Spirit of God is telling me to give you this tractor, so where do I bring it? And he didn't want fanfare, I and mean, he barely told me his name. He didn't want me to... There was, for him, the works that he did privately and what he was doing publicly for God, for me, for the church, it was all one thing in his mind. It didn't, there was, there was no other filter. I said, why would you give this to us? And he says, well, this is a Christian church, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he said, well, brothers and sisters take care of one another, right? And I said, sure, yeah, but not everybody comes knocking on the door, you know, but this guy did. His life that he, that he was living in private matched what he was willing to do publicly in the works that he did. So in the words that we say, we reverence our Redeemer. In the works that we do, we reverence our Redeemer. All he needed to know is that 
Y'all are brothers and sisters, right? And finally, we reverence our Redeemer in the way that we respond, in the way that we respond to others, to our circumstances, and to God. To others, to our circumstances, and to God. I notice this um, in my own life, in the moments where I, I lose control of my time. I was hanging out with a friend uh, yesterday, and we were supposed to meet up somewhere, and then he got stuck or didn't communicate or whatever and was like almost two hours late, and I found myself alone for two hours. And I said, wow, this is somewhat annoying, but this is also my best friend, and I understand the situation he's in, and I'm going to try to allow the Lord to change my attitude about this. And it, he did. I was, it was a two-second thought with me and God. And luckily and blessedly, I felt that, that there was a change within my heart. A different time in my life, I might have been really off-put by something as simple as that. And, you know, this guy and I have a laugh about it. We've been, we've been friends for many, many years. Sometimes it's our circumstances, right? Sometimes it's a circumstance that, that comes out of nowhere you couldn't see coming, and it just catches you off guard. And the question is, how am I going to respond in this moment? Is it going to revere and reverence my Redeemer? And then underneath and beyond all of that, we're always responding to God. God's responsible for everything we're going through, and He is the one that we're living before. So no matter what we have in the closet, may we all put on lives that are fitting to communicate the grace that we've been given, to celebrate and to share with the world. As we stepped into the text this morning, we, we saw that we are called to put off sinful patterns, just as surely as we are called to put on habits of holiness. And finally, we step back to consider what these verses have said about how we might reverence our Redeemer in all of life. Let's pray and come forward for communion. Our Father, we do thank You that Your grace is enabling us for greater capacities of health spiritually, for greater works of worship in the world, for a deeper communion with You. Your grace is enabling us to grow up into the fullness of Christ. We thank You that Your grace is ennobling us, Lord, to converse with one another, to converse with You in holy matters. Uh, to be those who have the capacity to give and to receive of your love in the world. And you are working this out in us. I pray this morning that as we come to the table, that as we remember the very precious blood that was poured out, the very perfect body that was broken for our salvation, that we would, we would be caught afresh in the power of your love, that we'd be lifted up to you, and that we would say, I love you, Father, once again. We pray this in Jesus' name.